evening, everyone. Welcome to Science on Saturday. I'm Dr. Joanna Albala. I'm the Science Education Program Manager at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I'd like to welcome you to this year's series of Science on Saturday, Science in Space. And let me tell you, this presentation is going to be out of this world. I'd like to introduce our speakers this morning. First is Dr. Matt Coleman. He is a senior staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore Lab, who received his PhD in biology from Boston University. Joining him is Dr. Matthias Frank, who is also a senior staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, who received his PhD in physics from the Max Planck Institute and Technical University of Munich. And we have a special guest joining them today, Dr. David Loftus, who is a physician scientist at NASA Ames Research Center and he received his MD and PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. And joining our team is Erin McKay. She's a biology teacher at Tracy High School, and she received her Bachelor of Science degree and teaching credential from UC Davis. Without further ado, let's get started. Thank you, Joanna. So I'd like to thank you all, first of all, for coming out today on a Saturday to spend your time with us and for us to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things we're working on, because this is not the usual type of project you think of a biologist, such as myself, uh, working on. And that's specifically on how we're going to develop tools for going through this next era of moving out to the moon and then moving out to Mars, and what are some of the tools we need from a biologist such as myself to help us do medical diagnostics uh, in space. So first of all, what I'm going to tell you about is why we're concerned about space and a little bit about time and distance in space. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the problems associated with space. And then what are some of the tools uh, we need to get out and stay out in Mars and stay healthy while we're out there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what do we think the next generation of tools should be? So we're going to talk a little bit about what we've developed now and what the new technology is going to look like, we think, in the future of 5 to 10 years or 20 years from now. So first of all, uh, space is an expansive distance that we have to cross and takes a long time. And maybe we don't think about this a lot, but the ISS, or the International Space Station, is roughly about 230 miles away from us when it's directly over us, and it's orbiting the Earth. If we go several more orders of magnitude, the moon is actually 238,000 miles, right? And if we go several more orders of magnitude, we're talking about Mars, which averages about 140 million miles. And those numbers sound sort of big, but one of the interesting things about Mars is that when Mars is close to us, Mars is actually only 33 million miles away. When it's on the other side of the sun, Mars is actually about 240 million miles. And that's a really big distance to talk about in terms of miles. So I'm going to invite Aaron McKay out here to help us understand a little bit more about that expanse uh, and, and distance. Erin, here you go. Thank you very much. So I can't believe he gave the talk and he was talking in miles. Really, miles? This is a science talk. We're going to talk in kilometers. So let's talk about some stuff that will give us some good perspective. So a kilometer, well, that's 1,000 meters. So here's a meter stick. Oh, let's show it the right way around. There's the meter stick. Um, but that doesn't really help some of you because you only deal with miles. So that, um, Kilometer is about two-thirds of a mile. So let's start with something we're familiar with, driving from here in Livermore to, say, Sacramento um, on the freeway, driving 65 miles an hour. So I guess it must be the middle of the night if we're actually driving consistently 65 miles an hour. Well, nicely, about 65 miles an hour is approximately 100 kilometers an hour. So how long would it take us to get to Sacramento? It would take us just a little bit over an hour and 20 minutes. Wouldn't that be nice? OK. Well, surprisingly, the ISS is not that far 
much farther than driving to Sacramento, except for it's driving in space from the surface of the Earth. So just under 400 kilometers. So how long would it take us to drive there in a car if we could? It would take us just about four hours. Now, that's conceivable. Driving to the moon, on the other hand, that's a little bit longer, because now we're driving 400,000 kilometers, and that would take us approximately a half a year. That would be a long time to be in the car. Then we have to consider how long would it take us to drive at freeway speeds to Mars? I don't know about you, I'm probably going to be dead on the shortest trip. <laughs> and nearly half a millennium on the longer side. Oh, and on the longer trip, we have to drive through the sun, and that's going to get a bit hot. So let's take a look at when we're doing proper space travel at a proper speed. And that takes us to going 27,000 kilometers an hour. So if we're traveling at that speed, it says we should be able to get to the ISS in less than a minute. I think it takes a little longer to get to the International Space Station than a minute. Oh, wait, we don't fly in a straight line. The trajectory is not in a straight line. And you don't want to dock at the ISS traveling at 27,000 kilometers an hour. Not going to be a good idea. It really takes about two days. And then traveling to the moon, if we were traveling again in a straight line, it would be about 14 hours. But again, traveling to the moon, it's not a straight trajectory. And historically, it took us approximately three days to get there. Now, traveling to Mars, we're hoping to travel just a little bit faster and going approximately 32,000 kilometers an hour. And at that this, um, speed, it would take us between a little over two months and a year and a half to get to Mars. Now, if we were going to be getting to Mars um, at that time, our real goal is to get there in about six months um, with the real planned um, orbit. So now I'm going to hand it back over. Thank you, Aaron. So hopefully now you have a good sense of, of time and space and those kinds of distances we have to cross. But we should also remember communication is also a key component. So if we're going to go to Mars and we're going to talk to somebody, uh, we're going to use light uh, as a means of communication, and it's still going to take time. And it's going to take more and more time the further we move away from Earth. So for instance, if I want to know, hey, how are you doing up there on Mars? And remember, when you turn that screw, left is loose, right is tight. It's going to take 20 minutes for them to get that message. And then if I say, hey, don't forget to turn the lights out and pick up some milk on your way home, it's going to be another 20 minutes for that message to come back. And they said, well, did you want 2% milk or 3% milk? So that 40, that's 40 minutes of time that it's going to take to communicate across the expanse of that distance. The other thing, as Aaron pointed out, is that it's not exactly a straight line to anywhere you go. The orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars actually matter in their position to, to each other. And so you, can only, you only want to leave at certain times when these two uh, planets are orbiting around the sun uh, and compared to each other. So the trip to Mars is planned to be about a six-month trip out. Uh, and we're going to leave when, it's, when the Earth actually circles the sun three times faster than uh, Mars does. So you've got to leave at the right moment. And it's going to be another six months uh, to come back to Earth. Right? So it's, very, it's really exciting. We do have modes of, uh, modes of travel that will get us, we believe, to Mars. But... Not many people have actually been out in, in space, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but there still are some inherent risks of moving out into deep space and into our solar system. And one of the biggest risks is radiation. Uh, the radiation you experience on Earth uh, uh, that comes from galactic cosmic radiation and from the sun is very different on Earth than in space. Isolation and confinement I want you to look around yourselves right now and look at the six people around you in the immediate area. You'll get to spend six months in the immediate area within about a, a, a 200 square feet space. And that's it. So, you know, you've got to be good friends, I imagine. <laughs> Reduce gravity. 
once we move off the Earth, uh, there are some profound effects about reduced gravity that happen to your body. Your heart will actually remodel and change shape. Your fluids that are usually distributed based on gravity on Earth will actually change. You will actually have a puffy face, uh, and the liquids move uh, in very different ways. Also, the environment. You're going to be confined in a tin can, right? Everybody's there. You're breathing the same uh, air. And if you go outside on the surface of, of, of the moon or Mars, then you have to worry about bringing in uh, that dust, right? It's more than just wipe your feet before you come into the house. OK. So one thing I want to point out is we've had over 350 astronauts go through the NASA program, and they've all been to space. Technically. Only 12 people, uh, roughly 14 people, because somebody always stays on a rocket ship when those people uh, in the Apollo mission go to the moon. Only 14 people have really been into what we consider deep space, outside of the Earth's uh, magnetosphere. Everybody else in the shuttle missions and on the International Space Station, as shown here, have been in what's called low Earth orbit. And we're protected by this magnetosphere because it actually helps block and protect us uh, from solar flare-ups, which produce energized particles that, that, that come out. And it also protects us from that galactic cosmic radiation that comes from stars going supernova and, and other things and colliding and happening in space. Um, so, we're, so we don't really know what's going to be beyond that uh, in terms of radiation exposure uh, as we move into deep space. And radiation is a concern because it actually can break our DNA. And my cartoon here is to illustrate you, to you with all these different colors is your normal DNA. When the radiation hits the DNA, it actually has enough energy to break the bonds in your DNA and split that DNA into two pieces. Those two pieces actually get repaired by uh, molecular machines in your body that are called DNA repair proteins. But sometimes those DNA repair proteins can actually make a mistake and cause a mutation. And I show you one of the little color bars is actually a light green because there was a mutation the one time it happened. And I am also showing you an example of cells that get irradiated and non-irradiated because we can actually look at these DNA repair breaks happening in real time in the laboratory. And what I'm showing you on the top in blue is the, is, is the nucleus of a cell that gets irradiated or non-irradiated. So in the top, it's, it's pretty much all blue because it's not irradiated. When it's on the bottom, you see these little bright green dots. I have a, a technique of fluorescently labeling the DNA repair proteins that all move into the place to fix that break in the DNA. So if you don't fix the DNA break correctly, you get a mutation. The more mutations you pick up, the more likely you are to have something go wrong in the cell. And that can lead to uh, mutations that accumulate and give you cancer in the end. So there is a long-term risk of more radiation exposure you get, the higher the risk is to get and, and have cancer. So, so cancer is a long-term risk. And I don't know if everybody's following the news um, or, or, or that you're even aware. Actually, astronauts get sick in space all the time. They get bumps, and they get bruises. Um, and things, things do actually happen. Uh, so first of all, dizziness and eye problems. Over 50% of all the astronauts uh, uh, have a problem with nausea and with vision. And most of that is caused because of that change in microgravity that I told you about in that fluid shift. But they do get kidney stones. There have been problems with their respiratory system, infections, a GI tract and stomach problems, and blood clots. And if you've been following the news recently, an uh, astronaut on the ISS had a blood clot. It was uh, diagnosed on the station. They talked to the medical people on Earth. On one of the next missions up to space, they actually put in medicine so that they could actually fix the problem. Now, we talked about this time and, and distance and expanse of space. 
So can you imagine getting that blood clot on your way to Mars? Right? Medical, and it, if it became more serious, you're not going to be able to come back home. It has to be fixed and it has to be diagnosed uh, in space on your way. There's no coming back. On the ISS, does anybody have an idea of within how long you can be back on Earth and in the hospital? Within 24 hours, you can be back in, uh, uh, on the planet, in the United States, and in a hospital from the ISS. Uh, from the moon, it might take you roughly that full amount of time, but uh, uh, it can be done. So what we're going to talk about are some of the tools that we're developing to help understand uh, how healthy you are, to help keep you healthy, and then when there's a problem, uh, that we can quickly diagnose it and then move on to fixing that medical condition. So to talk about what's currently done and what's available on the ISS and where we're moving, I'm going to invite a NASA medical officer, uh, Dr. Loftus, out to talk to you. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. So as a NASA medical officer, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the ways that NASA approaches medical problems in space. So currently, with astronauts on the International Space Station, this is the approach that we use. The most important thing is we start out with very healthy astronauts. That alone uh, gets rid of a lot of potential for problems. We really have very little in the way of in-flight medical resources. There's typically no physician on board, but we do have telemedicine support available, so the astronauts can talk to Mission Control uh, in Houston, and they can get all the advice that they need. And as Matt mentioned, in the event of a serious medical problem, you can evacuate astronauts to Earth, uh, which is a, a great um, fallback position to have. So you might wonder about, well, what kind of resources do we actually have in space currently? And you can see from the photograph to the right that our emergency medical kit is really nothing more than a glorified first aid kit, if you will. There's really very little available. So as we think about extending NASA missions into deep space, we're going to need a lot more technology to support the health of astronauts. Well, if we could put together a wish list of what we'd really like to have for these deep space missions, cer certainly we'd love to have medical checkups with a doctor on board, that would be really great. We'd love to have the ability to perform surgery and even to uh, take biopsy specimens from time to time. It would be great if we had uh, x-ray capability or the capability to do other forms of medical imaging. But what we'd really like is shown in that panel on the lower right-hand corner of the slide. That would be a clinical laboratory because a clinical laboratory it's just an amazing resource that allows you to figure out what's going on and to help make a diagnosis. Well, as a hematologist, uh, I have to tell you that the most important uh, specimen that we use in the clinical laboratory is blood. Blood is really the gold standard, and it's just an incredibly rich source of information uh, on which to base a diagnosis. So, as we go into deep space, at a minimum, we'd like our new medical diagnostic technology to have the capability of performing an analysis on blood. Now, we could do conventional blood draws, uh, shown in the panel on the left. That would certainly be possible. But what we'd really love to do is medical diagnostics on just a drop or two of blood using novel microfluidic systems that are shown in that photograph on the right. So how do we work with blood uh, in a clinical laboratory? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing about blood that's really, really cool, which is that if you put blood into a tube and then you centrifuge it, you spin it around at high speed, you can separate blood into different components. And that's a really helpful thing to do. So after centrifugation, the plasma goes to the top. The red blood cells go to the bottom. And at the layer in between those two components, you have the white blood cells. All three of these components have diagnostic information that's of value. There are more than 
1,000 proteins available in the plasma. The white cells have all kinds of diagnostic information, and even the red cells can provide a clue to what's going on with your health. Well, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, we're in the process of developing a very new way of handling blood specimens. And I'll just show you what that looks like. It's based upon microfluidics that's on a disc. This simple disc is where we place the blood and we spin the disc very fast. And by spinning the disc, we're able to separate blood into its components. And we can do a really nifty uh, set of medical tests on this very, very small specimen. So as you can see in the picture, we use the disc, and we use an instrument, which is shown in blue, which was developed at the University of Arizona. And that allows us to look at the different blood components and to get readings in a fairly uh, short space of time. The system is not unlike the full-size blood tubes that I showed in an earlier slide. When we spin the disc, we're able to separate the red cells, the plasma, and the white blood cells, each into their own zones on this microfluidic chip. And then the technology that's in that blue box that I showed allows us to generate optical signals, shown on the right as that big purple uh, signal, which give you a sense of the presence of a critical protein in the patient's blood that is a clue uh, to diagnosis. So that's how we use this system to, just with a drop or two of blood, provide information about the health status of astronauts. Well, I would love to tell you that blood is the best and the only uh, diagnostic fluid, but in some cases, in fact, we have to do things a little differently. Doc, I think you'll appreciate Doc, that. Doc, I need some help here. Oh my goodness. I was out there working on those solar panels, and I tried to do a split. I think I pulled something, oh. I'm, or I'm having a heart attack. I don't know what it is, but you got to help me, Doc. That's, that's not good. That's not good, but I think we can help. Where does it hurt? It's just everywhere, Doc, my chest especially. got to help me. Oh, boy. Well, I can see that uh, we'd really uh, like to get a, a blood sample from you. That would be great. I, I've got my medical equipment here. Uh, uh, I have a tourniquet. Uh, we could use that. And I have this lovely uh, doc, doc, syringe it, and needle. You're going to put the tourniquet on those. my tongue? Oh, I guess that's not going to work. It's going to take me 30 minutes to get out of this suit. I guess that's not going to work. Well, can you take off this, the space suit? Could you do that? 30 minutes from now, yes, Doc. Oh, gosh, 30 minutes. That's an awfully long time. Well, I see. Gosh, you know, even getting a drop or two of blood for our new medical analyzer is going to be a problem. Wouldn't it be great? I see you can uh, lower your visor. Wouldn't it be great if we get a sample of your breath and do medical diagnostics on your breath? Wouldn't that be fantastic? That'd be great, Doc, but I'm dying now. <laughs> Hang on. So uh, with that as an introduction, I would like to now uh, introduce Matthias Frank, who's going to talk about novel technology being developed for breath analysis for medical diagnostics. Thank you, David. And thanks, Matt. This was great. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if we could use some kind of non-invasive diagnostics to diagnose um, people, astronauts and others? Um, could it work with breath? So this is one other area that we're working on at Livermore and many other groups in the world. Uh, they're looking into breath analysis as a potential tool for non-invasive diagnostics. Uh, the reason why this could work is that um, your, your breath, the air you inhale and exhale, is actually in very close contact with the blood inside your lungs, in the alveoli, right, where the gas exchange happens, where the oxygen you breathe in goes in the blood, and where carbon dioxide that's produced in the body goes out and is exhaled in your breath. In the same process, there's a lot of trace compounds that are also dissolved in, in the blood, in particular volatile compounds. Volatile meaning they, they can be in the gas form at room temperature. They're present in, in trace concentrations, and they go into the gas phase in the alveoli and are exhaled. And you, know, you may notice that if somebody had garlic for dinner last night, uh, you know, the breath still smells like garlic or uh, the, the digestion products the next day. 
So there's, there's certainly compounds that are produced in the body that come out in breath. Um, so somebody said, um, breath is a window in the blood, and I think there's a real opportunity to, to look into using breath as a diagnostic tool. Um, breath actually is not only these exhaled volatile compounds that are in a gas form, but there's also micro droplets and nano droplets that people exhale. Um, you see larger droplets when people cough, but there's also very small droplets, micrometer sized droplets in breath, in normal breath. And these can carry larger molecules like proteins, DNA. They can also carry viruses and bacteria. So all these components of breath are potentially useful for diagnostics. Now, there's, there's challenges. I mentioned there's many different compounds, and the, the breath composition is, is very complex. Uh, I think up to about 3,000 different volatile organic compounds have been found in breath of humans. And it's, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, what makes things more complicated is that the composition of breath varies not just person to person, but also for the same person over time, depending on your, your personal habits, your exercise, your diet, Oh, whether you have disease, your physiological condition, and others. So it's, um, and also environmental uh, exposures, if you inhale any, any kind of um, fumes, um, they may be in your breath days later. So it makes it a little challenging to find the right markers for, for disease. So I wanted to talk about briefly how we, how we go about this market discovery. And you know, first we have, to, we have to sample breath. And I just brought a very simple device that we use sometimes. There's many different uh, devices to, to, to collect breaths, but here's a simple one that um, we're using. It's called the R-Tube. It's commercially available. It's disposable, so you use one, one sampler per person, so you don't have to you know, worry about uh, contamination. Um, you can use that to sample both the condensate, the, the droplets, or the, the vapor. So if you want to um, collect the liquid phase, what you can do is you, you know, use a cool device. There's an aluminum sleeve that you can put in the freezer or you can put in liquid nitrogen to cool it. You just put it over this tube. The tube has a mouthpiece and some valves that allow you to breathe in and out through that device. Um, and because it's cold, it sometimes has a, a sleeve. Right? And so you, you sit there and just breathe, breathe normally for about five to 10 minutes. Now, that's, that's pretty easy, except um, every time you tell a subject to breathe normally, that's the last thing they do. They go. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it actually works quite well. So you do this for five to 10 minutes, and then yeah, you have about a milliliter or half a milliliter of, of liquid breath condensate in there that it can cap off and take to an analytical instrument. Now, if you wanted to collect the breath vapor, this is something we actually developed at Livermore, and that company now took on as a, as a product as well. Um, you can add a little vapor sampler. This is called a spimi fiber. And what it is is a little device that's the you know, size of a pen. If you push this plunger, there's a little syringe coming out. And inside the syringe is a little sorbent material fiber that you can push out. And that um, is shown on the, on the picture back there, you know, spimi fiber, that actually collects these volatile compounds. They adsorb on that, on that fiber. And then you can pull that back into the device and take that to an instrument to do the analysis. Thank you. So that's the easy part, relatively. I should say, um, yeah, I mentioned there's many different types of samplers people have developed. If you're concerned of um, you know, collecting just a certain type of breath, right? if you breathe in with this thing, you collect the entire, entire breath. But some of the compounds that are in your breath might actually be contaminated with what's in your mouth. So if people want to just see what really comes out of the lung, they take usually the, the middle part of the breath. And there's some devices that are a little more complicated that just collect the, the middle part of the breath. So then you take um, your liquid sample or your spimi fiber sample or to, um, to a lab, and you can put an instrument. And shown here is uh, a graduate student, Kristen Rees. She's at Michigan State University doing her thesis work at Livermore Lab um, with us, uh, operating a, what's called a GCMS instrument. And this instrument takes that fiber sample, uh, desorbs the volatile compounds that are on that fiber, and sends them through some analysis chain where they get separated the compounds get separated and analyzed by mass spectrometry and outcome, uh, outcome and data. Uh, what's shown on the left side are chromatograms or data from breath samples. Each color is a different sample. These samples are actually taken from the same person over the course of a few days. And what you see is that you know, these, these, each one of these peaks, even the little ones, are compounds, volatile organic compounds. 
what you see is that overall the composition is, is relatively similar for this person, but then there's little little differences in between. Um, and and you know, in this case, there were probably just these, these normal variations that I talked about. But if you do an experiment where you look for some disease markers, you, know, you want to pay attention to some of these differences between uh, people. Uh, you can do the same thing with a liquid, and it, I'm not showing it here. There's another instrument called LTMS that does a liquid analysis, um, and you get similar kind of data out. So I mentioned the needle in the haystack. Um, yeah, there's many, many compounds that are always there, and they vary up and down. What you have to do if you try to find markers for disease, you basically do an experiment where you have a whole bunch of people who have a, a condition, are sick, and you have a control group that are healthy. You take many breast samples, and you basically compare them, and then you see which of these little differences that you find actually consistently associated with the uh, deceased group versus the healthy group. What's very interesting about breath analysis is it's not limited to respiratory disease. So you think, yeah, because it's breath, it's all kind of lung-related lung uh, diseases. It's actually sensitive to systemic effects. And I mentioned this gas, this exchange between the compounds in blood and the, the compounds in the exhaled air. So you can find markers that, that point to systemic diseases in, in breath as well. And there's actually a number of uh, breast diagnostics that are currently in used uh, for uh, airway inflammation, stomach ulcers. Uh, there's one specific one for heart transplant rejection. And there's many others that people are working on, and you know, some of them fairly close to actually applying them, uh, in particular in the area of cancer or respiratory infections. Um, what we also need to work on for, for space travel, you know, to study the effects of reduced gravity, bone loss uh, can be detected in early markers for that in breath, um, and in particular, the effects of radiation. So as we um, move breast diagnostics into space, um, you saw that you know, how we do the, the market discovery experiments using lab-based instrumentation, the big instruments. Um, they're certainly too big and too heavy to take into space. Um, so we need something that's actually much more compact. And this is where other instrumentation comes in that's currently under development uh, in various places, including NASA, NASA Ames. It's called the ENOS. What is an ENOS? Well, before we talk about an ENOS, let's talk about a nose first. So what's a nose? A human nose. A nose has uh, receptor, receptors in, in the cells in the nose that, uh, that bind these uh, compounds that are in the air, volatile organic compounds, other compounds. And there's, there's different kinds of receptors. I think the human nose has about 400 different types. And as these compounds bind, they cause signals. And then the pattern of these signals from the different receptors basically creates a smell or the sensation of smell. And with an e-nose, we're basically trying to mimic the same thing, except that we don't have biological receptors, but we have an electronic chip that has um, functionalized surfaces, little areas. Each one is functionalized in a slightly different way. So the different compounds, trace compounds you have in the air, in the exhaled air, or in the, in the environmental air, bind to these different areas with different probabilities, and so that create a, a certain pattern of how, how these molecules bind. And the nice thing about these chips is you can actually read the signal out electronically. So one device that NASA Ames is working on is an ENOS that's based on carbon nanotubes that are functionalized. So as these volatile organic compounds or other gases bind to these sensor elements, they can cause a change in resistance that can be read out with an electrical signal. And similar to the nose, you have you know, different areas that have different functionalization, so you can get a, a signal pattern out of your e-nose that corresponds to a smell. Um, our colleague, Dr. Ching Li, uh, at NASA Ames, ha has actually pioneered that uh, for the last 10 years. And she has pushed that te uh, technology to a point where um, these electronic chips can be integrated in a little device that attaches at the bottom of an iPhone. Just plugs right in. So this is an actual iPhone with an actual e-nose attached to it. And um, this was originally developed by NASA to just monitor the environmental air in space stations, in spacecraft, look for contaminants and things like that. But um, you know, Jing and others, together with us, we are looking into using ENOS for breath analysis and trying to, to push it towards detecting some of the, the breath markers we discover in the lab with these big instruments. Here's a, a small demonstration how, how this device would work. So this was actually done at NASA Ames. So there, there, you see an iPhone, and on the bottom is that Enos attached. Don't see this very well here, but it's in action. 
um, mounted to a little robot. And in this, in this area, there's an area that, that has some source of, of ammonia. Um, was actually, I think, glass, glass cleaner that was sprayed in a corner. And so they, the, the robot moves around as the ENOS is sampling. And you see on the, there's, there's basically an app on the iPhone that reads out that ENOS and each one of these colored curves is, is a different sensor pixel, sensor area on that, on that ENOS sensitive for you know, certain uh, trace gases. So if we have that, let's just see how this will play out now between Matt and David. All right, I'm ready to give some blood. Let's try the ENOS instead. Okay. That's it's going to be just what we need. You're not having a heart attack. Oh, that's great, Doc. That's great. Where do I get one of these now? Well, it's not available for human use yet. We're working on it. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry, we have to work on it. <laughs> All right. So I hope you enjoyed today's uh, discussion and, and seminar. Um, and you get a little bit of a feeling for some of the technologies that we're actually working on for NASA. Um, and so one of the goals, though, of course, is to take these two technologies and actually combine them into a single box that actually can be integrated uh, into the rocket ship or even onto an EVA suit, such as um, uh, the demo suit I'm wearing here. And so basically having the ability to do both blood-based biomarkers combined with breath, breath analysis would actually be the most ideal condition because you can do a whole lot of different types of health diagnostics and even uh, human research in space about what are all those effects of all those other things such as the, mi the, the microgravity or reduced gravity, the radiation, uh, 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 social interactions that can cause stress and everything as we go to Mars. So with that, you know, and having that integrated, it means even when I'm out in space or on the surface of Mars, I can quickly actually test, uh, test myself using breath analysis to give me some indication of what my current health status is, um, even if I'm just a little stressed out uh, about just being out there. So with that, I want to invite Aaron McKay back out. And hopefully you guys have some questions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>